who just simply shouts hallelujah. God knows who the person is, but please, subsequent testimonies that the class should put their name down, along with the testimonies. I want to thank God for the salvation of my soul, and also want to thank God that he has been providing for me and my family. Praise the Lord. Amen. Somebody give a clap offering to the Lord. Please give God a clap offering. If God is providing for you and your family in this time, you know that you are privileged and blessed. We thank God for this testimony. I also want to thank God. Um, last week I traveled, but something um, happened along the way for me to snap it. When we took off, they said the weather was very clear. But just about uh, when we started descending to, our, to land, suddenly storm from nowhere. It was so bad, we lost visibility, the plane was being tossed back and forth. At the point, it felt as if we were even trying to crash land. It was so terrifying. Honestly, I saw my life being rolled before me in seconds. I was so stunned, I could not even pray. All I was saying, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. And all of a sudden, somebody in the plane just you know, when somebody said, praise the Lord, everybody, big men, politicians, everybody shouted, hallelujah. We prayed and we cried and God showed mercy. I don't know, I don't know how to explain the experience, but if you're faced with death, that's when you value your salvation. And honestly, since then, I've been thinking about heaven. I've been saying, Lord, don't let me ever miss heaven. Let's not take things for granted. You go out, you come back, and you did not even see anything. He did not for you to praise God. He did not allow you to see all the words he has been waiting for you. So, church, praise the Lord. Amen. For every one of us who are alive today, it means God's purpose and plan for us has not been terminated. I want us to stand up and thank the Lord for these testimonies and also for our lives. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. Thank you, faithful God. Thank you, merciful God. We thank you, the ever present help in the time of need. Father, we ask, Lord, let our hearts never cease from thanking you and appreciating you. May we never cease to see your goodness and your wonderful works in our lives. Let testimonies, whether in church or in our individual lives, let it be a lifestyle for us from today on. This we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Please let me sit there. Good morning, church. Good morning, sir. Uh, this is uh, a good time. Let us pray. Father, we want to thank you this morning for the gift of life. Thank you, Lord, for another day in your presence. Thank you for all that you have done for us. The baptisms that you have won, the ones that we know and the ones that we are not aware of. Lord, I accept our thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we ask this morning that your spirit will lead us to all truth. We open our eyes to see wonderful things in your word. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, everlasting Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Uh, last week we discussed about um, praise and worship. Uh, we talked about, uh, we spoke about the right uh, essentials of thanksgiving, sorry. And we spoke about the right perspective and then acceptable thanksgiving. Uh, talked about acceptable, acceptable thanksgiving as a thanksgiving where we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, you know, and then so that God can accept our thanksgiving and our offerings. And I believe and I trust God that uh, we will continue to do that and the Lord will continue to accept our thanksgiving in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So this morning, the 10th of September, 
we are going to talk about the Great Commandment. Is there anyone here that knows the Great Commandment? The greatest of all the commandments. Yeah? Lord, oh, thank you, sir. Thank you, man. Our memory verse is taken from Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 7. Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 7. Uh, can we read together? What to go? Many, Many waters, waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. If a man will give all the substance of his house for love, it will utterly be content. Let's begin. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. If a man will give all the substance of his house for love, it will utterly be content. Okay, so um, he talks about love. Then talk about many waters cannot quench love, whatever it is cannot quench love, and then the flood of life cannot drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, he would utterly become content. One of my colleagues was discussing with me the other day, and he asked me, he said, "Are you practicing social distance?" I said, "Yes." He said, "Whether even with your wife?" And I kept quiet. Is it possible to keep social distance? Huh? That's what I said. Ah, the Lord knows. <laughs> All right, so that is what love can do. Even in the face of the coronavirus, no man or no woman will agree to keep social distance. And that's the essence of what we're talking about, the love of Christ today. Our Bible passage is taken from Matthew 22, 35 to 40, and somebody will read for us. Yes. One of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, pointing him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments come all the law and the prophets. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So the Bible says that love, love is of God and God is love. So that's the first of course. In other words, love is a fundamental characteristic of who God is, as is shown in John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You know. Um, he gave the, his, his only begotten son, only begotten. Our Lord Jesus Christ emphasized this by identifying the commandment to love God as the first and general law, after which he declared the directive to love fellow human beings as the second most important law. That's the, the Ten Commandments summarized. Love God and then love your neighbor. The Holy Spirit shed more light to the link between these two aspects of love. First, uh, who is in 1 John 4, 20? 1 John chapter 4. If a man say, I love God, and he said his brother is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, how can he love God, whom he has not seen? That is the practicality of love, you know. And, and I love what the Bible says, even when he talks about when somebody comes to you and is hungry, don't just pray for him and say, go and be filled. It's not a matter of faith now. And when after praying for him, you can go in there and bring a tuba of yak and then help the man or a combo of rice or something. So that it will be practical, it will be practical. God loves us practically because He demonstrated it by sending His only begotten Son to die for us. Uh, in Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 7, love is said to be unquenchable and has more worth than all of the possessions because it satisfies nothing like nothing else can. Mm. Love satisfies like nothing else can. So when a man is in love, can he be hungry even if the wife is? Spending three hours in the kitchen. That is a question to ponder about. Praise the Lord. So we have to add like love towards God and love towards fellow human beings. The Bible says that our love for God is related to the fact that God first loved us. Remember, He first loved us. So our love for Him is not predicated upon. Uh, can I say, who me, as in Right. It's not predicated on our rights. It's predicated on the fact that he loved us first. The wife who are yet sinners, he loved us. And then 
His uh, love for us enables us to obey Him freely, without a body of guilt, of fear, of punishment. Loving God requires knowing Him, and that knowledge begins with His Word. To love God is to worship and praise Him only. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3. Who is that? Exodus 23. Nobody is there. Okay. Exodus 23. You must not have any, any other, other God, God but me. Okay, so he, 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 he commanded that, you know, he, we should love him only. We should love him alone. We love him only him. Don't love your money more than God. Don't love your position more than God. Don't love anything worthy more than the Almighty God. To love God is to desire Him, to yearn for Him, for His righteousness, His word, and His grace. Psalm 42, verse 1. Psalm 42, verse 1. As the dead panted after water, O Lord, my soul panted after the water. I think I'm going to yes. So, the Lord God is to obey him. However, this is not a matter of merely following rules and registering good deeds. It's all about having God's love written permanently on our hearts. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. Anyone there? Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with yes. all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. We will love our, our God with, you know. I think you completely love God with all your soul, all your mind, your body, your deeds. In fact, everything that you have, you should love God wholeheartedly. Now, you know, God's love should be, our love to God should be hundred percent undiluted. Hundred percent, as in hundred over hundred. Excellent, A plus, A plus plus. That's it. He doesn't want any, you know, that's why he talks about not being lukewarm. You know, we like warm things as human beings, but God hates warm things. He loves hot things, you know, and he doesn't like cold things. So he loves love hot things. So when you want to love him, love him in a hot way. So that you look and see, ah, what is, this man is, you know, what is wrong with him? He's, he's so much love God. May the Lord help us to love him in Jesus' name. And love Number two, uh, as my two, love towards fellow human. We can express our love to God through those who are who are created in His image. Mark chapter twelve, verse thirty-one. Is anyone there? Mark twelve. Yes. Love. Okay, so love your neighbor as yourself, as yourself. So if whatever you cannot do to yourself, or whatever you you will not like somebody to do to you, don't do it to your people. You know, um, some people will say it doesn't matter, I'm expressing my human rights. But you see, human rights cannot be God's rights. Uh, you cannot be right in the sight of God. There are a lot of things that we claim that are rights that are not, that are not godly. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. Amen. God's kind of love is that which gives to those who did not deserve it, including our enemies. And Jesus said, love those who despisefully use you. That was a Bible study we had in the early 2000s. And for about two weeks, we were studying love those who despisefully use you. And then Luke 6, 30, he said, give on to anyone that asked of you. And if any man take it to your coat, they will let him go. So we started asking pastor, and the pastor was telling us, is it your Bible? Did I write the Bible? Do you love God? Do you believe the one that wrote the Bible? That's obey. And in fact, but that's what God wants us to do. And if we imagine it that everyone obeys or adhere to this rule, do you know that there will be peace on earth? There will be peace everywhere. Because when you love, when you love everybody like yourself, you will not do things that will hurt them. You will not pack their money and just go and keep it in your account and, and run away. And we keep blaming you, woman, right? May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. So, God's kind of love is that which gives to those who do not deserve it. In Luke chapter 6, verse 32 to 35, it talks about what I just spoke about. The, the, the Bible says that we are to love others the way God loves us. First John 4 7. So love others the way God loves us. You know, we are to love the family of God. Romans 12 10. Who is there? 
Proverbs 12.10. Yeah. Yeah. In honor, preferring one another. Just prefer the next man. Don't don't struggle for anything. Praise the Lord. Love does not struggle. They don't. You know when you love somebody, you don't struggle with that person. Naturally, you know you want to just uh, calm down for each other because you love each other. I just I I pray that there will be one day where people will not show love on the road in Lagos that we can stop for ourselves to, to just drive drive well. You know you will see somebody who put sticker. I am born again, I am redeemed, and I am sanctified. You know, somebody said to me one day that many cars might go to heaven and the owners might go to heaven because of this car. Uh, you see, bishop or clergyman, but he's just driving anyhow. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. Amen. One practical way to help others is to imagine ourselves in their shoes. Loving others does not mean agreeing with everything they say or do. Nor does it mean acting in a way that always gain their approval. Loving our neighbors means attending to the need to their needs, both physically and spiritually. In Luke chapter 10, verse 29 to 37 is a long one. That's the story of the, the Good Samaritan. Uh, we love our neighbors best when we share God's truth with them. When we share the word of God with them, just put in something. You know, there are a lot of educated people around now. And when you go to them, say John 3:16. They will just let my friend just get out of my phone. But you just go the way, you know, there are things you just, when you talk about the business, you talk about the corporate world, keeping the word of God, keeping what Christ can do, and then you will, you will be interested. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. I've told us about the story of a big man that I know that went for a meeting. Somebody said, you want a meeting. And when he got to COD, he saw the way the Bible study was done. He happy and sees Till he left us, he will go for Bible study on Tuesday. So he said, no, no, I like that your pastor. I mean, he knows how to just bring it down to our level. And I said, oh, that's God, sir. He's a lawyer. That's why he can bring it down to our level. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. We love our neighbors best when we share the word of God with them. Jesus alone can save. And he alone can meet people's every need. We love our neighbors out of an overflow of God's love for us. And the way of demonstrating our love towards God. Colossians chapter 4, verse 5 to 6. He said, Let your word be seasoned with grace and salt, you know, so that you will know how to answer all men. You know, when you speak good words to people, they begin to look at you in this in this current situation where people just talk harshly. When they notice that you are always very consistently speaking, you know, with grace, I say, This one must be this day. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. In conclusion, the love towards our neighbor is an evidence of our love towards God. Let the love of God fill your heart. Romans chapter 5, verse 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 5. Yes. And God make up not ashamed because the love of the Lord is shared abroad in the hearts of the Holy Ghost, which is given us, which is given to us. The, the love of God is shared abroad in our hearts, you know, you know by the Holy Ghost, which, which is given to us. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. Any question? Okay, so if there are no, uh, how should you how should believers express their love towards God? Yes, one, just one person. Yes. How can we express our love towards God? Yes. Yeah? How can we express our love towards God? It's, it's a very simple question, yes. By loving each other. Yes. By worshiping him, yeah, that's it. How should we expect our love? We should expect our love to God in total, you know, obedience. Just submit to him totally. Praise the Lord. May the Lord help us to love him in Jesus' name. Let's bow our head and in prayer. Father, we thank you this morning because you have uh, shown us again the reasons that we need to obey your, your commandment of love. Lord, we ask for grace to love you all at all and love our neighbors in the name of Jesus. Thank you, everlasting Father. In Jesus' wonderful name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. You are the Lord, and He led me.
our bodies in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you're here this morning with your tithes, can you please step forward? If you have your tithes, please bring them forward. Do so as quickly as possible. We have our tithes. I'm not sure if we were reminded, but the tithes now will come before the message. Father, we thank you, faithful God, everlasting Father. Thank you because you are faithful, and thank you because, according to your word, you will open the windows of heaven and pour us a blessing that our storehouses will not be able to contain. And Father, we pray that for every time that you rebuke the devourer for our sakes, in Jesus' mighty name. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If they forced you to come to church this morning, then praise the Lord. But if you're excited to be in his presence, go ahead and shout hallelujah. Give you my life. Church, the Lord bless you. You may please be seated. This morning I want to share a topic which I have titled, Your Destination is Intentional. Praise the Lord. <coughs> Your destination is intentional. If you got on an airplane going to London and the pilot said, Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome aboard this aircraft that will be flying to the Republic of China, what would you do? <laughs> get off that plane fast. If it was going to Iraq or Iran, you get off even faster, right? <laughs> Your destination is intentional, praise the Lord. You cannot arrive at a destination accidentally, especially a good destination. In other words, you cannot arrive at the right destination accidentally. Praise, tell your neighbor, please. Just tell, help me to tell your neighbor. You cannot, it's impossible. You cannot arrive at the right destination accidentally. Praise the Lord. And I'm sure you know we're talking about heaven. Amen. That's the ultimate destination. To make heaven, you must live intentionally. Praise the Lord. You must live deliberately. You must live purposefully. Hallelujah. You can't just do anything, anyhow, and say, oh, <laughs> by his grace, I will make it to heaven. It cannot happen. It will not happen. Praise the Lord. If you look, you will see the vision and mission statement of the redeemed Christian Church of God. What is the vision? Clear. Read it now. To make heaven. Praise the Lord. And to take as many people as possible to have a member of RCG in every family. To make heaven is the fundamental one. That's the vision. Praise the Lord. Now, how do we achieve that vision? That's the mission statement. Holiness will be our lifestyle. 
In other words, if I want to make heaven, I must pursue a deliberate, purposeful, intentional lifestyle of holiness. Praise the name of the Lord. And I pray that today the Lord will help us even to arrive at this point in the name of Jesus. Safe arrival at your intended destination depends on your deliberate, intentional you know, a process. It involves making the decision, planning, and execution. Praise the Lord. I repeat once again, it is sad when you hear people and they're talking as if they're eh, well, at his grace. Eh, maybe. I'm not saying, oh, thank God for his grace. But if I want to go to Ikeja now, and I sit down and say, hmm, ah, Ikeja, will it happen? I must get in the car, or call and get in the car, start it, turn right, drive to Chevron Junction, turn right, keep going. Am I correct? Follow a map in order to get your destination. Praise the Lord. You see, it doesn't even depend on God. Yes, sir. It doesn't depend on God. If it depended on God, you would on God, you wouldn't have read, I stand at the door and I knock. You just have said, Hey, I come, we're going to heaven together. Doesn't work like I wish it worked like that. I would just relax. <laughs> Unfortunately, it gives us the free will to make the decision. And that's why we can read in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. Deuteronomy 30, 19. I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. And what does he ask? What does he encourage you to do? Choose life. Tell your neighbor once again the choice is. The choice is yours. The choice is yours. And one of the ways to start this process is to ascertain the requirements for your goal and then pursue it relentlessly and intentionally. Hallelujah. We give an example. You want to go to London. Where do you start? Do you just wake up one minute and say, I'm going to London? Try it. You will get past the airport. You will first check, what do I need to get to London? Ah. I need a passport. Okay? You get the passport. Right. What's the next thing? I need a visa. Even the visa, you must have certain things. Oh, bank account, letter, this, that. You take the steps, intentional steps. Then you, so you now have your visa, you have your passport. Do you now automatically land in London? What must you do? You book a flight. You book the flight. And then you not only book the flight, because if you book the flight and stay at home, what will happen? <laughs> the flight will take off. You go to the airport. And when do you go to the airport? Anytime you want? In good time. And then you board the aircraft. And by the way, you, you, there's all kinds of security at the airport. You must comply with all of them. And then finally, you sit on the plane. Thank God for stepping. That testimony was, was, can you imagine on that plane? Thank God for your life. You are on that plane now. Nothing can happen. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. So it's not accidental. You can't get there carelessly. And since I believe that we're all unanimous in wanting to make heaven, so can I assume that we all have a common destination in mind? Heaven? Okay, if you don't agree, let me see your hand. Okay, it's carried. Praise the name of the Lord. So decision, planning, and execution. What is decision? Because of time, obviously, I'm going to have to be very quick. Decision starts with acknowledging that you have sinned and need a savior. Just like you say, I want to go to London, you, get a, you check what the requirements are, you buy a ticket, visa, and all the rest of it. You, you decide, you know what? I need a savior. If I continue like this, I will not make heaven. And so, like you read about in Luke chapter 15, verse 18, the prodigal son said, I will arise and return to my father. It's a decision. He made a conscious decision. He said, what? You know, I'm tired of this. Enough is enough. Let me go to God. Let me surrender my life to Jesus. And usually it must be, usually it involves a public confession. I'm not saying it must be, but it's wise and advisable for it to be a public confession. You believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth. And then now you've made the decision. Is that where it stops? No. The next thing is that you must plan. Like I said, all the steps, I want to go to London. Okay, uh, visa, 
this is the requirement. I must be this. I must show that I'm coming back. I must do this. And you look at all those things and then you begin to implement them. So the planning stage is how you ensure that your decision becomes a reality. Praise the name of the Lord. Oh, in fact, for many, for example, for many places they want to see your accommodation, they want to see you have enough money, along with all the other things. The other thing that you need to watch out for, when you're traveling, and you carry, you know Nigerians, you see them at the airport with all kinds of things. If you carry contraband and you reach foreign airport, what will happen to you? They not arrest you in the name of Jesus. I remember many years ago, um, I was traveling, I was in Frankfurt, and they suddenly came to meet me after I had passed through um, security. And I was what was happening. Police. And they wanted to, you know, they were interested in my bag. And I was thinking, yeah, what happened? And then I opened my bag, and I'm like, guess what? There was a little kind of nail clippers. You know, I didn't even know whether I was for my you know, some nail clippers or something. And they felt tiny thing like this, like scissors, or you know, like clippers that like could be a weapon. And I was like amazed. And they were like, yeah, okay. I mean they were not making an issue, they understand but I really can't take it with me. What do I want? I said, I take, I mean, I mean, take no problem. You understand? That little thing could have stopped me getting to my destination. Make sure there are no little foxes that will stop you getting on that flight or making it to your destination in the name of Jesus. So, make sure there's no contraband. How do I live holy? Sin, sin separates me from God. One of the things you need to do is to keep consulting the guidebook. Praise the name of the Lord. And what's the guidebook? The Bible. Let's quickly go to execution. Now, the difference between a regular trip and this heavenly trip, if you are going to London or wherever, you plan you have all the time but with this trip when is it when is the trip coming up yeah, anytime. anytime that's the dangerous thing about it anytime when you least expect <laughs> nobody knows the hour like a thief in the night so you must be ready always ever ready or else you miss the fight praise the lord living intentionally my beloved brethren is to live on purpose deliberately with a specific goal in mind. Now it follows if living intentionally means living on the purpose that you must discover what is the central purpose for my life. What is God's purpose for my life? That must be the goal of your life. And there are many examples in the Bible to help us get to that point. For example, Hebrews 12, 14. Hebrews 12, 14 says, Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Isaiah 59 2, Isaiah 59 2 says that your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you. Matthew 7 21, Matthew 7 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. This particular one is very instructive because it indicates why many people miss it. This refers to those that come to church, bear the title of Christian sound like Christians, dress like Christians, but are not intentionally pursuing a path that will lead them to heaven. Some people may discover, God forbid, at the last moment, they say, sorry, you are, you are going to be deported. You can't enter this, this country. But to bring it home, God forbid they will get there and say, I know you not. You walk out of the liquid, that will not be our portion. That would not be our experience in the name of Jesus. And what worries me as I conclude, in many people, including myself, you look around you, is that we are living far from intentionally. As a matter of fact, we are living carelessly. We are so careless about our eternal destination. You know, we just believe, eh, well, it's okay, God is merciful. Eh. It just, you know, it doesn't matter. It's like you're walking on, you see somebody walking on the road and he's, maybe he has headphones and he's almost hit by a car. That's careless. Are we living carelessly? You can't just do anyhow and think you'll make it to heaven. It doesn't work that way. We can't be careless about our eternal destination and make it. You can't be careless about God and make heaven. You can't be careless about sin and see him in glory. 
You can't buy a ticket for London and end up in China. You can't buy a ticket and get a visa for hell and then end up mysteriously in heaven. It doesn't work that way. You are required to make an intentional decision. You decide, you know what? This is where I want to get to. Now, what are the requirements for getting there? And so every day, my goal is to make sure I do what it requires to get me there. And anything that is contrary to that, I push it aside. When you see some people that are focused, this is successful people that are focused. If they want to go from here to Ikeja, nothing can stand in their way. If you want to delay them, they'll push you aside. And I want to go with you. When I start the car, if the car, if you're in the car, you go with me. They are focused. They set their eyes like a flint. And anything that is going to hinder them getting to Kenya, <laughs> they will be violent about it. That's what is required for us to make it to heaven. You must decide today where you want to end up. You must plan and set the goals to ensure you make it. You must work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You must live ready. Isaiah chapter 50, the end of verse 7, NLT says, Therefore have I set my face like a stone, determined to do his will. Determined is not maybe I will try. I will do it. Anything called sin. Joseph was determined. He was intentional. He was ready to tear, leave his jacket. And you know what? Nothing is going to make me sin. I pray we receive that kind of determination in the mighty name of Jesus. And once we set our eyes like the flint, determined and purposeful, then don't look back. Looking back and getting into trouble. Ask Lord's wife. She looked back, she became a pillar of salt. And so I want us to go ahead and bow, bow our heads and begin to talk to God. You want, you want to make it to heaven, your eternal destination, and you need help. You need God to help you. You need, you want to be determined, you want to live a purposeful, intentional, and deliberate life. Go ahead and talk to God. We are going to be asking God for help and for grace. But if you are here and you have never given your life to Jesus, remember we started by saying you must make the decision. And so if you want to surrender your life to Jesus, that is where it starts. Just raise your hands quickly and somebody will pray with you. You are here and you have not yet accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Please raise your hand so that I can pray with you. I know I can't get to heaven accidentally. I can't get there carelessly. I receive grace. I receive grace. I receive grace to live intentionally for you. Let my story be every breath is for you. Every step is for you. Thank you, everlasting Father. Blessed be your holy name. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Father, we thank you. Give you all praise and all glory. We ask that in all our lives the grace to live intentionally will be positive. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Teachings you submit yourself to. 
ask the Lord to take him to higher ground. Ask the, ask the Lord to multiply his word in his life. Let him become a living word. Let him be filled with the grace and the power of the word of God. Father, we thank you for your son. We thank you for your grace upon his life. We thank you for using him as a vessel. We pray, Lord, that you will replenish him. Father, water him. Increase your word in him. Every word that comes out of his mouth, which is your word. Father, back it up with signs and wonders. Amen. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. We pray that he will finish well Amen. and he will finish strong. Amen. This word will not stand against him on the day of judgment. In the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Still in the attitude of prayer. There is nothing like coincidence in the presence of God. From the testimony to the message. But one thing I know, after that encounter, the Holy Spirit led it in my heart and said, be heaven focused. If we begin to think about heaven, imagine heaven, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal heaven to us. Nothing in this world will be able to match that desire. And that desire will be what will spur us to do whatever that we need to do to make it. When you're hungry for something, like Pastor said, it's not accidental. And one thing I have done that has helped me, I went to so many men of God, maybe before they died, the kind of speeches or messages they gave, some have had encounters where they went to heaven and God had to send, I tell you, it's so amazing. I challenge each and every one of us. The more you hear stories about heaven, you will want to go to heaven. You won't be afraid of death. We are so much attached to the world. We hold on to it. Now when they talk about heaven, it's like, oh, when the time comes, it's because we don't know heaven. It's because we've not had a glimpse of the glory of heaven. And we're going to pray this morning. Just one prayer point. Father, reveal heaven to me. Just give me a glimpse, a glimpse that will change everything about my desire, my priorities, my intentions, my plans. Just give me a glimpse of heaven. Jesse Duplantis said, when I got there, I saw Paul. I saw some of the apostles. I saw Jesus. I could see God. He said he can't describe God. And he said, Jesus, where is the Holy Spirit? He said they have sent him, that God has sent him to the world to help us Christians. And yet we don't even recognize the presence of the Holy Spirit. He said he's there in the world. Please go back and tell my people, I am coming again. It is not a fairy tale. Some people will say, ah, they've been saying it for a thousand years. It will only take a day. I want us to cry from the depth of our heart. Father, please. Whatever you need to do in my life, make that switch now. That will make me heaven focused. Father, this is my cry for my family, for my loved ones. Give me a burden for a dying world, Lord. That the blood of Jesus will not be in vain, Lord. Ah, Father, help me. It will be a shame if after everything we leave here and we don't even know where we're going. We carry the way we cars, houses, good life. It will be a shame. If after every experience we have with the Lord Jesus, we will not be able to see him in glory. Father, put a hunger for you in our hearts. 
a desire until we make it, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Praise you, the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's be seated. Hallelujah. There are first timers in our midst, people who are watching with us for the first time. Could you signify by a raise of hand so that we can welcome you specially? You are welcome to his throne. You are welcome in Jesus' name. First time. You are welcome to his throne. Lord has done for me. He has taken away my sorrow and I will. 